So what we are here to talk about is making books for kids and why that is a lot harder than you might think. So first, I want to have everyone get a little bit more information about Miranda Harmon. So Miranda is a Floridian living in LA. Um, and she works in animation and does comics. Her books are the Mayor Good Boy series, Spring Cakes, and Market Day. And Miranda, if you could just real quick tell us a little bit about Mayor Good Boy and what um, drew you to this topic and sort of how you thought about structuring it for a kid audience. Yeah, absolutely. So Mayor Good Boy is a story about a good boy who's a talking dog, and he becomes the mayor of a small town. It was written by my friend Dave Scheid, and I was the illustrator and co-creator. Um, and yeah, he came to me with the idea. I thought it was really interesting and fun. It does kind of delve into local politics a little bit, uh, but it's really just about optimism and community. And it's about these two kids, uh, Abby and Aaron, and, and how really they can just do what, whatever they want to do you know, to help their community. So I'm just showing a couple panels. It's a real like... Um character-driven book. You've got a lot of really amped-up characters. Here's Mayor Goodboy Turns Bad. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the <laughs> next one. <laughs> Mayor Goodboy Turns Bad. That's coming up. Yeah, in December. So I'm going to move on to talking to Shauna Grant, who is representing in her outfit. <laughs> Shauna's works are... Sorry. She has a love of all things pink and magical. Um, and she's born in New York City. And this book is Mimi Boo Hoo Blas. Um, and Shana just told me she's actually doing one of the upcoming Babysitter's Little Sisters books. Yeah. Oh. Um, or two? Did you say you're going to do two? Um, yeah, I'm doing two, yeah. Which I'm a big <laughs> Babysitter's Club fangirl, so now I'm like a little bit shy. <laughs> um, and this book is with Scholastic as well. So we're just going to go through a few pages. Um, and this work has a really nice um, interplay between actually a tricky topic. Like, you know, a lot of your books get into bullying and kind of big emotions. Like what we talk, I have two kids, we talk about big feelings, um, but in a very sweet art style. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So in this book, Mimi is having a blah day. She's just not feeling it, and she wants to feel happy again. But sometimes we aren't feeling super happy, and that's okay. It's okay to sit with that. And I just wanted to make a story that shows kids that you don't always have to feel a hundred percent and happy and perky, we all have our down days, and that's fine. This is a really lovely spread. Um, tell me really quick about these outfits. You know, how do you, what's your reference for? Yeah, so I grew up on Sailor Moon, and I just love Match Girls <laughs> and Transformation. So my Mimi series, I like to think of it as baby's first magical girl. Mimi uses the magic from her best friend and stuffed toy dog, Penelope, to transform into different outfits, and I wanted to use that as a way to show Mimi exploring, um, you know, different personas and stuff. Um, I guess you can kind of think about it like the old Rugrats episodes, where a lot of it was like imagination. And I know kids love to play dress up and pretend. So as Mimi goes through trying out, you know different things with her outfits. She's exploring different aspects of herself that might resonate to kids as well. So next, I just want to introduce Rodrigo Vargas and Connie Giovanninas. Actually, can you, pronounce, can you pronounce your name again for me? My name is Connie Giovanninas. Thank you. So Rodrigo and Connie ha are based in Santiago, Chile. And they co-created The Do-Over, a middle grade graphic novel from Clary. And it published in 2023. And I was so excited to read this because we actually covered it in our um, preview announcements at PW that I wrote up. And it really caught my eye. And it was, it's fabulous. My daughter really loved it. I want to say all these books have been kid tested and approved by my particular kids. <laughs> <laughs> in the lead up to this panel. So this is a book about a girl who moves and starts her own rogue hair salon. Do you want to get into it a little bit? I'll show some slides. 
Um, do you want to start? I, okay. Okay, so uh, as you said, the do-over is about three girls starting a hair salon. We started with the idea of having three girls who start like a business and we tried to think of something fun. I don't remember how we got to the hairstyling, but it was really fun to just be able to do the craziest hair because we could think of. So, it, but it's also about having uh, not only they put up this business and they have to make it run, but they also have di uh, creative differences and pretty much having to work things out as yeah. friends. Yeah, it's, it, it has a lot of uh, trying to learn to work together and, and embracing the embracing of each other's personalities and, 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 and the strong points. On yeah, because like everyone has their everyone has their strengths. own skill and strengths, and 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 try to complement each other with that. Yeah, we also try to make it very funny. Yes, because <laughs> we really like comedy, so we tried to we put up as many silly jokes as we could. So it was a lot of fun to work on this. Here's a more somber moment. It's also a story about grief. Yes, yes, that that actually didn't come up at first. Mm. We realized it. Uh, we realized that it was a book about grief, like in the process of writing it, which was kind of a surprise. We knew that that there had to be a reason for for the characters to behave the way they did, right. and um, and it came out like that. And I didn't know about it that it was going to come out like that. But actually, um, so I, I've been dealing a, a lot about uh, I'll, I'll, I've been dealing a lot of like issues with death recently because of family stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know about it then when we started it, but it came out like uh, it helped me uh, work out a bunch of stuff. Mm. And kids deal a lot with death and big topics. And I think it's something that when children's literature embraces and also reflects it back, it's very meaningful to them. Yeah. So this is Lee Luna's mm -hmm. Clementine Fox. So Lee is from Albuquerque, New Mexico and graduated from MCAD. And she is, her day job is as a, an, you know, in animation. She works as a color designer, went to Steven Universe, Sensual World, Clone High. But this is her debut graphic novel published by Scholastic. And it's a lovely classic animal adventure story. And I was saying to Lee, even though the panel is about simple designs. Her designs, I actually feel, are anything but simple, as I think is evident in this spread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this book and maybe some of your inspirations for it. Um, Lean into the mic. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I started working on this book uh, around 2013. I was in school at the time and at working as a teaching assistant for a lot of children's classes. And I loved it so much. I love teaching. Um, and I had all these little girls that were a little bit difficult. And I, as a little girl, was also difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't something that I had quite seen reflected in literature the way that I felt really saw me. Like, at, at the point where I was with that, I, I, we had stuff like, you know, The Hobbit, which is very adventurous, but there's no girls in it. Or, you know, Babysitter's Club, where all of the girls are, like, very, you know, put together. And even when they, like, mess up, they, like, are still able to work it out in a way that is not, in my opinion, particularly realistic for how kids actually work. Um, and I wanted to write more about that messiness and more about the conflict um, that happens as you're growing up. And so Clementine was born out of that, mostly like the desire for having more representation of this specific type of personality and then also having adventure stories that could maybe connect with girls more than we had had at the moment when I was growing up going to show a couple of other pages. You, I think you can really see the influence of your color work here as a, an animator. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been working as what's called a color designer in animation for the last seven years. Um, and in animation, there's a couple of different jobs that involve color, but my job is mainly coloring like characters and effects and props, like anything that actually physically moves and has multiple frames, I color those. And yeah, I don't know. I have been influenced heavily by a lot of the shows that I've worked on, if it wasn't quite obvious from my painting style. I worked on Steven Universe for a while. I worked on Centaur World for a while. And those are all very, very vibrant shows. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that is kind of my sensibilities just as a whole is to lean more towards the vibrancy. So with Clementine, I wanted to play that up a lot. And in the earlier pages of the book, when she's like, sorry, Quick side note, so the plot. Um, mm. Clementine is a nine-year-old girl who is not particularly good at math, and when she is told that she is going to need to have a tutor, she decides to blackmail two of her friends into going on an adventure with her instead. Um, so that's what my book's about. And in the beginning, when she's home and when she's in school and when she's uh, you know, dealing with mathematical home things, all the colors are very muted. Um, there's a lot of browns. There's a lot of more earth tones. And then as she gets to the island and it's more magical adventure, we become very vibrant. And it becomes you know, more lively in that way. So I'm going to go back to our main slide here. But I want to say that as you're, as you're answering these questions, everybody, we can pull something up again if you want to show some of the art, you know, to talk about it. So, you know, I was talking to Rob, who, pulled, who put this panel together, and really we want to have a craft talk. Like, let's get into the shop talk of what it is that you do that makes comics accessible to kids in a way that teaches them the language of comics. Um, and actually, the first question I wanted to ask is more about how you get at um, exploring these difficult themes through the language of comics. So both, if you can each talk about how you choose a theme, and then also if there's like narrative problems in, in approaching these topics that comics uniquely helps to solve, you know. Um, and Shauna, do you want to jump in because you were you're, the work you showed here is actually about, you know, big feeling sadness. Mm -hmm. um, another work that I looked at is about bullying, right? Like you've done that too, the cutie catastrophe, right? Um, so how did you get into this, and how do you solve some of those big problems with comics? Um, yeah, I just really love um, addressing things that have to deal with empathy and emotions, period. So um, I was actually asked by Scholastic to consider doing a comic mm -hmm. for early readers. Um, it wasn't something that I really knew about mm -hmm. before. So I was like, OK. Um, but in like Cutie Catastrophe, the theme of the story is being true to yourself and um, a lot of the characters in it are like well you're too cute you know to do this and that and Mimi doesn't want to feel boxed in so she has to explore like other ways you know that she can be strong or smart and ultimately you know it's just about you can't worry about what other people interpret you as it's about you know just being like who you are and Mimi is cute, but she is also still strong and smart and cool in her own kind of way. And I just wanted to show kids, you know, that you can be whatever you are. And especially with girls, um, I know, like, when you're small, it's really easy to want to, like, reject pink and girly stuff because it's always interpreted as lesser and everything. Um, that's how it was like for me and now that I'm older I've just fully embraced the pink life so um, it was really important for me to write a book like that especially with a dark skinned character mm -hmm. because you don't often see dark skinned girls um, being the heroines of their story and also being shown as um, cute spunky characters and with the boohoo blies um, I've just always you know wanted to talk about feeling sad and depressed you know it's something that I've dealt with and it's something that a lot of people deal with even kids and so um, thinking of a way to show it for um, younger readers, what I did was actually represent Mimi's feelings mm -hmm. as an actual character in the book. And he's like a literal blob that attaches to Mimi. And the more she tries to do other things that makes her friends happy, um, but not necessarily like herself happy, the more frustrated she gets it with her blahs and the bigger it grows throughout the story. So the kids can see um, visually like, wow, Mimi's feeling worse and worse. The blah is getting bigger and bigger. But also I try to use a lot of expressions with my characters to show visually what the characters are feeling and going through because that's like a really big key point of comics is the visual literacy and being able to tell the, the story without having to rely on so many words to express everything. 
Yeah, and I think like with the blah, there's something that's a bit of physical comedy about mm-hmm. it, and that kids might react to as something funny, but that they are then interpreting without even explicitly interpreting it as something that can help them understand their own emotions. Yeah, um, I wanted it to be something like, yeah, it's serious, but it's not something that you should totally be afraid of because it's very normal. And um, Penelope in the book tries to explain to Mimi as well, like, it's normal to feel blah sometimes. It's okay. Um, But, you know, it's also natural if, you know, you're not happy about the way that you're feeling. Um, So just, you know, as you go through the story with Mimi, you find that you can try different ways to cheer up. Um, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, and just because somebody else really enjoys um, dancing or reading lots of books about animals when they're down, it doesn't mean that that's what's going to make you feel better, and that's okay. You just have to like take time and just ride through it. So Miranda, there's an element of satire in this work, mm-hmm. right? So I was thinking it's like it's it's sort of like a dog man audience. There's a lot of crass humor. Um, kids are re- My son, who is going into kindergarten, which is a very like potty humor age, loved this. I was writing his his favorite in all the books I was looking at. He keeps talking like, I want to read the dog mayor book. Um, but how did you use the language of comics and some of the background details to make more of a satirical point that might speak to parents, but also might sort of seed something for kids? Uh, well, when when me and Dave uh, made Mere Good Boy, we talked about it and we decided we wanted it to be a little bit about about politics and being mm-hmm. active in politics, but we also know that it's a book for kids, and so we weren't going to really be able to make a book about, you know, joining a committee or or like like the you know the the day to day the actual day-to-day of, of local politics that wasn't going to be easy to explain in a way that was entertaining. Um, and so we made this really silly book, but I think at its at its heart, it is about like these characters who are very optimistic. Mm-hmm. And like they do, the, the two kids, Abby and Aaron, they they have these problems and they they solve them in the ways that they can, you know, and the ways that they know how to. And like Mayor Good Boy, he, he needs help from his friends because he's a talking dog, but he can't hold things. Uh, he has no thumbs. <laughs> he can't eat chocolate. Uh, he needs help getting up on the podium. You know, so I, I think that's kind of the heart that we were trying to get at was was accepting help. You know, and um, but I, I don't think it, it's really. I'm not, I'm not sure we were really going for like a specific kind of satire. Mm-hmm. It was really just about being optimistic and helpful. Can you talk about character differentiation? Like how, on a craft level, did you think about the larger cast of characters in this book? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I knew that I wanted to make the characters look simple because I know that when I was a kid, I wanted to draw the characters in the book and Mm. it would be easier for simple characters, for kids to draw them. And also I knew I was gonna be drawing them for 200 pages, (laughs) so I wanted them to be simple for me too. Um, but I, I mean, I, I really like curly hair. I gave the characters all curly hair because that's really fun for me to draw. Um, but I really want them all to look different. Abby has these big round glasses, and that's kind of like her, her visual signifier. And then Aaron is very skinny, and his arms are all wobbly. Um, so I definitely wanted them to look very identifiable and different. And then Mayor Goodboy himself is all fluff. <laughs> this, this <awful. laughs> you have a consummate little brother character here, I have to say. He's always sort of the butt of the jokes. And uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Rodrigo and Connie, can you, uh, since we have you both here, can you talk about collaboration and how you work together in creating this world? Um, and I want to say from a publishing perspective, I do think that collaboration is something you see as a growth area in young adult and younger people's comics. There's more often perhaps a publisher putting two people together. You came together on your own, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, when basically they asked us to make a book about three girls and to start mm-hmm. their own business, and we came up with this, a bunch of these ideas together. 
until we realized, oh, okay, this is what we're going to finally do, right? But when I grew up uh, starting to make comics, I was making comics with friends, and it was always a process of an active collaboration. Like, everybody had something to say about the script, everybody had something to say about the layouts, and everybody had something to say about the arts. So when me and Connie started working together, we decided we're going to we're gonna be both involved in every part of the process. Uh, I'm the writer, so I'm, I'm going to have to take the, the reins on the, on the writing part. But, but it's always built together as a, as a, as a complete team. So uh, when we sent the, the first uh, draft, it was something we both worked on, and we both realized each page has got to say what we need to say in the way that Connie can visualize it, mm -hmm. so she could eventually draw it, and in a way that I'm happy with what the characters are saying. Um, the same thing happened later with the art, because um, I don't know if you want to take that part. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. Well, um, yeah, as Rodrigo said, we work uh, together very closely on the whole thing. So on the, li like on paper, it's like Rodrigo is the writer and I'm the artist because he did most of the writing. You could say like, I don't know, yeah. four fifths of the right, two thirds, I don't know. But most of the writing and I did most of the art, but we worked together like when putting together the plot, doing like little post-it notes, which is each scene, like this goes here and then this and then this, and then Rodrigo turned that into an actual script. And it was the same for the art. I did most of the work, especially with the characters. I'm a very character-driven person, while Rodrigo is more of a plot-driven person, so he was really good at making the plot work, and I work more on the characters, their personalities, making sure they stood out as, like, I don't know, like, fully-fleshed kids instead of just, like, generic characters, I guess. Uh, but we also worked together on the art for this one. Actually, Rodrigo drew the backgrounds. So that really cool scene on the previous page was all him. I just drew the characters around. He has a better gra grasp on perspective than I do. Um, and it was actually fun because this one is drawn on paper. It's colored in Photoshop, but it was drawn on paper. And we would like trade pages around. And also then the pandemic happened. And we were lo on lockdown, and we had to like visit each other at the grocery store <laughs> and be like, no, we're here to buy groceries. And then I just throw a folder of pages at him, like, by the way, <laughs> here's pages. I'm not sure how we worked that out, but it works. Also, we live together now, and the next book we're doing is digital, so. It's even easier now. It's even easier. Easier than ever, but. It was a really fun journey, trying to like piece everything together. Yeah. There's more, it sounds like, to that story. <laughs> um, so you lived apart, and then you lived together now. We yes. do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, you, um, did you do research for the setting? That, because you were based in Chile while writing the book, but it's set in America, yeah? Y yeah. How did you go about that research for the space and place? So um, Here's this, the thing, right? So me and Connie traveled to the States uh, for the first time mm -hmm. in 2018, 18. right? And we came to SPX that year. Then we hung out uh, in New York for a week. We fell in love with each other. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to, to CXC, CXC, which happens in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of personal memory style with Columbus, Ohio, and we walked around the city a lot. Yeah. So at the time when we had to base, uh, as, you know, as Chileans, you're always like wondering, like, will these people care about the story that happens in Chile? And a bunch of people told us, like, yes, you should make a story about, that, about something that happens in Chile. But also, like, it's scary. It's mm. a very scary process trying to be like, yeah, well, what if we instead make a story about a Latina girl that lives in the States and the only city that we both knew really well <laughs> was Columbus, was Columbus Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, a lot of people have actually read the book and they post about it online like, oh, that's where I live. Why do you choose? I was like, we just like to visit there. Yeah. But yeah, and also like, we like the idea of doing something more local to us, but it's hard to publish that here without being like, 
ooh, it's about Latino. And it's like a whole thing. And it's like, no, this is about girls who do wacky haircuts. Yes. And the location <laughs> goes second or third. Also, Cartoon Crossroads is a really great show that has wonderful programming if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sponsored. No. But it's a really good but show. But it's a fun it's a show. show. Yeah. And it's a nice city. Yeah. I, I will be there this year. Ah, oh, nice. And the Billy Ireland is oh, a really wonderful Amazing museum. museum. That's a good segue, Lee, to ask you a little bit about um, how you plan these pages. Again, we're doing a shop talk, but if you have just anything you want to give us for the detail of how you get into the difficulty of simplicity, because um, you know this is a work that's very accessible for kids, but I, there are very complicated adventures happening here, right? So you have to do you like make a tree, like a murder plot, to figure out how everyone's going to connect together. Yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, the way that I wrote this book was like, I will, I will never do this again. Like I will never <laughs> ever do the process that I did for this book again. Um, this started as a web comic where I was making it weekly, and I had no idea what was going to happen the next mm. week for the first, I don't know, 75 pages? ish. Um, and at the time that I was making it a web comic, I was making it through Andrews McNeil and they were putting it up on the on their site gocomics.com, which is traditionally like a space for Calvin and Hobbes and Kathy and Garfield and not really middle grade comics. Um, but they wanted to they wanted to try it out. So we did that. Um, we did it for about two years and then mutually decided like it wasn't quite working out for either of us. Um, I wasn't getting like a whole lot of traction for their website and you know, they, I wasn't getting a whole lot of traction for their website. So, um, so yeah, so like the first 75 pages of it, I sat on for like four years and then my agent was like, will you please stop sitting on these 75 pages of this book and let me pitch it? And I was like, fine, Jen, yes, let's do it. Um, and so from there, I was like, wait, what have I written? And then it turned into like a murder plot, like full branch, like, Po pointing at the board being insane. Um, and it took a really long time to like get my brain back into the mode of like thinking about this story or knowing really what I wanted it to be at that point because I had done it so long ago and I had really didn't have a thought of like what the ending would be at that point because you know it's a webcomic in theory I could just you know make one piece and do it forever. Um, but yeah so that's that's how this came to be. Uh, I am just now finishing thumbnailing the second one, which a lot smoother. It's really a lot better to write when you know what your ending is going to be. It's so much easier. So I want to ask a question that is, um, it's really a two-parter. And the first one is that we know from the publishing side of things, and I'm sure you all encountered this, that when you're writing kids' books and middle grade books, publishing has a set of like rules and structures and expectations for reaching those audiences. Like typically you don't have someone smoking a middle grade book, right? Um, how did you thread the needle in terms of thinking about these big topics and wanting to be accurate in terms of representation and then being sensitive around language, behavior? Was there anything that came up where your editor, your agent talked with you about that? Any kind of anecdotes around figuring that out? And in, in that, embedded in that, is like how much do you spend time with kids? And like what, you know, how did they give you feedback about that or help you think about how you approach these topics? Okay, can I start? Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like I said, I, I had taught previously to, or like I worked as a teaching assistant previously to working in comics. And um, in that regard, like there were issues that I, I did witness, like mostly these like nine year old girls experiencing. And like one of the biggest ones, that I remember feeling when I was younger and ex and seeing other girls experience was like these eight-year-old girls, nine-year-old girls are going, I'm ugly, I'm mm -hmm. fat, my thighs are fat, and I'm dying, like I'm literally dying. Um, and I really wanted to put that in Clementine and Scholastic really would not let me and were very much like, this is not a thing that we are comfortable <laughs> talking, like, and by we, I mean we as a society are comfortable talking about in, in this age range. Like it is a thing that is kind of saved for middle school books, YA books. Um, and that, that sucked a little bit. Like, it, it, I wish it had been a thing that we could have discussed more. But yeah, point blank, that is. Right, yeah. that definitely came up. And I think that is an interesting issue, is that you have, there's, there's an aspirational aspect to children's publishing often. Absolutely. Where they want to have representational that's positive, and then I think there's ways of pushing that. But I think it's a, it's oh, yeah. a dance, right? Yeah, and I mean, similarly, like, 
in publishing, we can get away with a little bit more. Working in animation, we are constantly being told to like make characters look more aspirational, and I'm mm -hmm. grateful for comics and getting to like have that little bit of ugliness to mm -hmm. it still. Um, but I, I do wish there was more of it in, in this age range specifically. Does anyone else want to bring bring in? Uh, so the other side of this, the two part of this is comics are under uh, books are under attack currently with uh, censorship and book bannings across the country, and particularly comics in the YA and kids space are coming under attack. Did you find yourself in doing this work aware of that, fighting against it in any particular way with the ways that you push boundaries in your work, and did you have conversations about it with your publishers that you're coming into that environment? Um. So uh, in the do-over, at least, we, we, we didn't really have that many problems. Um, it's, n it's not a book that's actually like pushing boundaries. We were pretty tame with it. Uh, there is one instance where mm -hmm. something did happen, a couple of instances. One's more funny than the other one. Uh, <laughs> so I grew up in punk rock. And the idea of people starting a business and working for stuff and, and worrying and fighting about, about money feels very dirty to me. Like, that's not something I want to bring into the book. And um, in the second book, because this is something that actually happened on the second book. A spoiler alert. A spoiler alert. The so the editors were really pushing for a story where, where um, two of the characters fight for who gets a bunch of money. Like, it's a contest. It's situation. a contest, and, and they have to choose like which school club gets the money, if it's the soccer club or the or the or these girls are getting like I don't know I don't know how much money was it. I don't know. It was like five hundred bucks. Or yeah, something. like five hundred bucks. So to me, that idea felt super dirty, right? Uh, uh, and and I wasn't comfortable with it, and. It, it took a long time, actually, of, of back and forth. It was like, a lot of emails. It was a lot of emails. So many but, emails. Yeah. Asking, like, I do not want to do that, because that, that's not me. And, and I'm not sure that we, sh we shouldn't have kids worry that much about who gets money, because it's not, it's not the idea of it. Like, the idea of the book is kids building something together. Yeah. And, and that's why there's, uh, I, don't, I think there's only one panel where money is involved, like, <laughs> OK, so the girls got paid. And yeah, this almost like it. sliding a dollar bill. <laughs> yes. Uh, the other, the other uh, situation where we did face some, like, uh, it's, it's more funny. So there's this character in the book um, who has a hair styled in a way like, you know, corn, mm -hmm. like an ear of corn. And it's, well, let me see if I can. Uh, it, you're going to see it very small. You're going to see it very small, but but. We, well, we, we, really well, we meant it. wacky haircuts. We meant like this guy has a corn cob for hair. So when we wrote it in the script, we were looking for some 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 weird shape or some weird item that would be like odd to have on your hair, and we chose um, an eggplant. An eggplant. <laughs> <laughs> And our editor right. was like, now where this is I don't know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we knew exactly uh, what, what it meant, but also, like, an eggplant has a funny shape, right? <laughs> we were like, we don't mean anything weird. We don't mean anything weird, but it's like a purple <laughs> thing with, with, with the shape. It and, goes and a little sideways. Yeah. It's, it's a funny look, right? Uh, yeah, so that we had to, to tone that down and trade like, it for okay. the corn, which... It's fine, but it's it no eggplant. It worked out. <laughs> I think it worked out. I like corn kid. This yeah. is one of the better answers to the now, unfortunately, typical book banning question I've had. <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't had any issues. I know there are real issues. Yes. We, we just got, like, don't do eggplant hair. <laughs> yes. We were like, yeah, OK. We don't going to be canceled for eggplant hair. Um, but, you know, it's a good segue to asking generally, though, if anyone wants to speak more to, like, publishing in this particular fraught climate, I'm open. I want to, I think it's very important to keep bringing this into the fore. But are there other ways that anybody else dealt with the whole structure of working with an editor and an agent that you think would be interesting or instructive to this, to the groups of who may be aspiring to make this step in their careers? I was saying for SPX, you know, you're all actually with major multinational publishers, right? So it's, but you come here as independent producers. So what was that bridge like, and what were some challenges that may have come up? And then we'll get to audience questions in three minutes, I promise. 
Um, yeah, so my Mimi books was like the first time that I was making like a graphic novel like from the ground up with a major publisher. Um, before that, I had illustrated a graphic novel with First Second that was about the civil rights movement, but I was only doing the illustrations. Um, this time, I had to, you know, come up with characters and the stories and everything. And it's very different from just, you know, working on web comics and publishing them yourselves and and everything. And, um, and also having to actually think consciously about what audience am I writing for? Because before I was just like, well, I'm writing for my inner 14 year old. Mm -hmm. And now Scholastic's like, oh, I have to like write for six year olds old, okay. Um, but like, I don't know, it came a bit natural, I guess, because I'm just kind of like used to talking about topics and like, I don't know if I want to say like simpler, but in a way that is easy for like all age ranges mm -hmm. to understand. Like with my webcomic, it was all about like different types of love and, and romance. And, you know, I've had like young six year olds really enjoy it because there was nothing in there inappropriate for them. And, you know, I had ol older people enjoy it. So um, with Scholastic and uh, Mimi, um, they kind of like came with like, okay, I wanted to do this as like a picture book and they were like, can you make it into a graphic novel? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, well, we want it to feel kind of like little Lulu. And I'm like, you're lucky that I was able to watch that as a kid on HBO. So I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was interesting making something that like appealed to me, but also would like please my, my editors mm -hmm. and everything. And um, and then in relation with like the book banning and everything, it's it's a little nerve wracking. Like um, I haven't gotten you know into any conflicts yet. Um, doing a graphic novel for early readers is a bit different from like the middle grade range. Um, like just the whole marketing aspect is just it's just an awkward spot. So um, it's still kind of like a little low on the radar. But like when I was posting it on social media and like one of my posts went a little viral on Twitter and just a lot of people were seeing it. And I did notice like some comments that were like, oh, this will be okay, but I hope it's not like indoctrinating anyone. And it's like just purely because it's a book that features all people of color, like mm -hmm. the main characters are black and Latino. And um, I just wanted to make a book that reflected like how I grew up, mm -hmm. um, but also like in a more joyful way, um, cause I feel like a lot of media that's for a black audience is always dealing with like racism or, you know, like the history of, you know, civil rights and, and everything. And I'm like, well, I lived in the projects and I really liked, you know, reading about, you know, Sailor Moon and Peach Girl and just like regular issues, you know, but also I wanted to be able, you know, to make something where kids can see themselves. Um, because growing up watching cartoons, it was always like white suburbia and everything. I was like, well, that's not like what I experienced. So I wanted to do something that was like a more joyful approach to, you know, having a book full of people mm -hmm. of color. Mimi lives in a little apartment building. Her friends are her neighbors. And that's how it was for me growing up, playing with my neighbors and, and playing with my cousins and everything. And um, yeah, so it's just, it was interesting working with Scholastic and balancing what I wanted and what they would approve of. And I didn't run into too many like things. Um, I feel like the most was just um, getting them to understand like manga quirks. And it's like, <laughs> oh, she doesn't yes. have fingers in this panel. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, it's chippy. It's cool. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, and just getting advice on making sure that the language was, you know, simple enough for kids. Because again, this is like a book that kids would read to kind of like learn how to read by it's themselves. It's an early reader. All. Yeah. Yeah. Or early and emerging reader. Yeah. <laughs> so we have nine minutes left, so I feel like I'm beholden to give it over to the audience. Um, but I have more questions if you do not. <laughs> Anybody want to raise their hand? Yes, in the back with the black flag shirt. 
Oh, no, it just says read. Thank you. Oh, please go to the microphone, the, to your left, stage right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wow, I'm really loud now. Um, <laughs> I was just, I know you kind of already talked about it, but I was wondering if there was anything that you would have wanted to include in books but you couldn't include of because publishers were, um, I think publishers maybe have a different idea of what kids actually read. Like um, when I talk to kids, like, oh, my favorite book is Demon Slayer, but you can't really include blood or anything like that in an American um, like YA book. So I was wondering if there's any other topics. I know, Lee, you already discussed it, but if there was anything else that like, you guys thought, oh, I would re really like to have included this, but I can't because publishers have maybe a different idea of who children are than who children like, really are in real life. Um, I can not think of anything. Uh, well, it's not the same, but like the first pass that we made at the book, we, we, we wrote the whole thing, right? Uh, we got notes on it, and after like page 100, it was, this is too much, this is too much, this is too much, this is too much. We, we got way too intense, I think. Yeah, like, like the main character had an actual fight with her dad, yes. and it got like really intense. Like a fist fight? No, 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 no. not that intense. They were shouting at each they other. They were shouting the at each other. Like yeah. she start because they're like I don't know twelve, so they're like not actual teens, but kind of getting there. I have a twelve-year-old, so I'm with you on this. So it was like no, and you don't get it, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to my room, and it was like a whole thing, and it was like please tone it down. But actually, I think it I worked, think that out worked out for the better. Out, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, we we went a little bit too much. Yeah, like sure. we we. Before working with a publisher, we heard from other people, especially in our local groups, be like, oh, when you work with, a, with an editor, they like keep putting like walls that you can't cross and like impeding you from doing things. But actually, they helped us steer a lot of things in the right direction. Yeah. And it was like, damn it, we have to write over so many things. And it was a lot of work. But I think the end result is so much better because of it. Yeah. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Editors can be right sometimes as an editor. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Miranda, did you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, so um, I actually had a pretty easy time working with my editor at Random House for Mayor Good Boy. Uh, there wasn't a lot besides things like they have to be wearing seat belts, you know, which is normal. Mm. And I work in animation, <laughs> and it's kind of similar in that way, too. Um, but in my book, Spring Cakes, which is for young, young readers ages four to eight, there is, it's about kittens who go through the woods and there's a scene where they, they go, they find a bear and the bear is purple and fluffy, but he had angry eyebrows. Mm -hmm. And so I was told you can't make the bear angry. What? <laughs> <laughs> the bear has to be a little happier and the, the mom, she can't have sad eyebrows. And I thought that was, that was interesting. And, and I'm happy, you know, happy to comply. It wasn't an, a hard fix, but when I was a kid, you know, I, I loved things like like where's the where the wild things are, books that that were sad and had had things like anger and sadness and those I kind of I feel like I connected to those more, so that was a little surprising to me. It sorry, I can say anything. It is really strange. Like a lot of publishing houses have almost this like checklist of things that they mm -hmm. like are expecting a book to hit or they would like a book to hit that, and there's like a different one like for early reader versus middle grade versus YA versus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they really do like hold true to that, which is a little bit of what you were saying about like, do they, do they know what kids like? Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are like, I don't know, there's a little bit of a shoehorning into this like box of things you can and can't do, like eyebrows apparently. <laughs> I'll just put a shout out that if you've read Toon Books, which is Francois Mouly's press, she doesn't really seem to adhere to the same concerns of a lot of other publishers, so you'll see much more frightening, like Art Spiegelman's picture book is terrifying, <laughs> that's under Toon, that's just something to check out. Um, more questions from the audience, yes, please, so I, please, I'm directing you to this mic, so sorry. <laughs> seconds. Yeah, no, you're good, you're good, I'll show you all some more pages of the do-over, which I really love this book. <laughs> This Hello? I like, this is her scrap, this is like Instagram, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, so I had a question. If you guys had a story idea in your mind already, how would you go about figuring out what 
age range to fit it into, how to pitch it? Like, how do you figure out which demographics to aim it at, and how, what do you sacrifice for the story to do that? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess that you could, technically, you could make any idea for any age range. You just got to be tactful on how to address it. Um, because I don't think um, there's like a, like a book about death. That that can be something that kids read. And a book about, I don't know, sexual relationships. That's a book that kids can read. But you got to know how to, to, to address how to it. Approach it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't just, you know, make a whole mess of stuff happening in there. <laughs> I think um, if you have a, a, a good story that you feel like you can see yourself in it, just... Think about when would you have felt that way before in your lifetime. Like uh, somebody once shared this graphic online uh, that it was like, a, you know, that, that, that starts really little and then it goes really high and then it goes really little. So most people and a popular stuff. Chart. Yeah. Okay. Most people are, are, and popular stuff tend to be right in the middle. So they're very popular. But that doesn't mean that the sites are wrong. They're just part of the same graphic, right? Uh, so even if you feel kind of weird or, or an outcast or felt like different, or it's something that somebody else also felt before. So if you remember when you felt that way, I think you can find a, a, a pretty good like, grip on, on when to put it or what audience to have it for. Also, it's a conversation, right, sometimes with your representative. Did all of you get representatives before you came up with your book pitch, or did you have, like, are they part of helping you think about who the audience is? Um, yeah, so before my Mimi books is when I got um, an agent who I happened to meet at the right time at an anime convention, and she happened to previously work for Scholastic, which is how um, my art came across their table, mm -hmm. even though somehow they already knew about me. I don't know, I went to a lot of conventions, but um, yeah, it's definitely a lot different, especially having like the right agent that understands the kind of works that you want to make. That's also like what they're really passionate about. Um, I work with Jana Morishima, and she's all about you know emotional stories and just you know feely feely stuff. So we mesh really well together. And just coming up with Mimi's been like a big group project, especially when my editor totally tears apart my super great outline and I have to start all over again and just cry to my agent and be like, oh, I guess they were right. The next one is better. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to think about how they thought of the audience? And I'm actually very interested in how you think about it with like actual children. Like are you, you know, you're saying you've worked with kids, so you have some insight into this. Has anyone else thought about conversations they've had with kids either since you've written and published your book, like questions you're getting back from young readers that make you think about the next project, or relationships you had that helped you think about how you wanted to write to this contemporary audience of children? Um. Well, the reaction I've been getting um, about Mimi from kids and parents has been like super positive. Um, and I just, I try to write about stuff that I think everybody experiences, you know, like we've all experienced, you know, feeling sad. And I've done a lot of school visits as well where I talked about like the boohoo blahs. And, you know, I asked them, like, we've all had like a blah day, right? Um, maybe kids won't understand exactly like what is feeling depressed. But, you know, we all have had moments where we had to go, oh, blah. So they understand what that is, you know, so they're able to, you know, already be like oh okay so this is how I feel sometimes okay I can you know relate to that and they really take to it um, they've also had like a lot of fun drawing the own, their own versions of Blas or like their own little Penelope companion which is um, really fun but um, yeah I feel like if that was a book for middle grade, like it would be a completely different book, mm -hmm. but like 
kids, you know, they experience the same thing. So you just have to tailor it to what they'll be able to understand. You have to match the vocabulary that they have at that age range. We have three more minutes. Does anyone want to hop onto that question about like funny questions you got from kids had influenced you in any way? Um, I just want to say um, when I started working on Mayor Good Boy, I wasn't, I was like, I, you know, I never really found fart jokes that funny, uh, but <laughs> kids love fart jokes. That's something I learned, so absolutely. I, and I want to make kids happy, so I'll, <laughs> I'll keep adding them. I've been having, my book's only been out for like a few months, so mm -hmm. this is like the second show I've had it at, so I haven't gotten to meet that many kids yet who've <laughs> actually read it, but I've, um, a handful of kids have come up to me and been like, I got in trouble at school this year, and I'm like, okay, what'd you do? And then they like tell me why they got into detention, because my book is about a child who is deeply flawed, and I, it just, it's just wonderful to connect with like those kids, because they are not necessarily like kids who are, you know, going to sit in the library and read all the time or whatever, like they are kids who are a little rough around the edges, and I'm, I'm just very happy to connect with them. Mm. So we have two more minutes. Do we have time for more, one more question? One more, anybody? Oh, you're very far from the mic, but just run over to the mic. <laughs> I can't hold it against you. <laughs> All right, so I have a question about when it comes to crafting the pages, the panel layouts and whatnot, do you have to keep it in mind that you have a younger audience so you mm -hmm. can't get as ambitious with how you lay things out? Or is that, is that something you guys have experienced? It's a great question. Um, well, we've always been pretty straightforward with our panel in any way, so we didn't have to change that much. Um, the only thing I think that we had to change was sometimes we change a scene from one page to the next, and our editor was like, can you please add a little caption that's like, the next day, <laughs> just so it's clearer. And for some of them we did, I think there was one of them that we didn't do, because it was like, no. It works in context. This is comics. They will get it. But that's mostly it. Well, that's that's actually, I think, the most complicated panel we have. Um, in the book, with it, where it's the same character showing up multiple times. Um, so we we're keep it simple, but we're also like, if kids are reading more comics, it's really easy to pick up uh, like the visual literacy to do that from mm -hmm. context. Like, I got into comics reading manga. That yeah. stuff is all over the place and no one's playing it to me and I got it. So I trust that kids <laughs> will know what's going on. That's how I wrap my response. Oh. <laughs> As you've seen I these. mean, I thumbnail each one of my pages twice. Like there, there is a first draft and then I go back and read it and I'm like, oh, I can't, I don't know what this means. So <laughs> no one else will and then I gotta redo it again. But I usually have, I usually will give it to someone who has absolutely no concept of what I'm writing about, and if it makes sense to them, we know we're good. That's a wrap. So I just want to thank all of our panelists.